Hello, everyone. It is good to be talking to you at this unusual online edition of ICLDC. Uh, my name is Anna Ballou, and I'm the Outreach Coordinator for the Endangered Languages Project, or ELP. And I'm also a recent PhD grad from UH Manoa, so uh, talking to you at ICLDC feels, feels like coming home. I wish we were all in Honolulu together, but maybe next time. Uh, so today I'm excited to talk to you about an initiative that's underway at ELP that we're calling the Revitalization Help Desk. Uh, this is going to be a digital resource to support language revitalization practitioners all over the world. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the needs we're hoping to meet, uh, our goals with this project, and our plans for executing those goals. So before we start, obviously we're all watching this from different parts of the world, but I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from the traditional territories of the Multnomah, Wasco, Cowlitz, Kaflamet, Clackamas, Bands of Chinook, Tualatin, Kalapuya, Molala, and the many other peoples who live and work and travel along the Willamette and Columbia River Valleys in Portland, Oregon. And I'm very grateful to be talking to you at, well, at ICLDC, which is usually held on the lands of the Hawaiian people. So we're all probably familiar with this statistic that by best estimates, there are about 7,000 languages spoken on Earth. Uh, and again, by our best estimates, almost half of them, or about 46%, are currently at risk of falling silent, are somewhere on the endangerment spectrum. And this represents a scope and rate of language loss that is unparalleled in known human history. It is worse than it's ever been, but on the bright side, the rates of language revitalization and reclamation are also higher than ever before. Uh, we, may, we may know this, we may sort of intuit this from our time in the language revitalization world that this is a fast growing field. Uh, and we probably know that new initiatives are beginning all over the world all the time, but the growth of language revitalization is sort of hard to quantify. Uh, but if we were to want to quantify that growth, as far as I know, the only global overview of language revitalization programs uh, is this paper by Gabriela Perez Baez and her colleagues presenting the results of a survey of 245 different revitalization initiatives all over the world. Uh, obviously, there are revitalization programs not represented in the responses to that survey. There are likely many that have begun since that survey was undertaken and hopefully many more that will begin in the near future. Uh, but I do want to say if you are engaged in language revitalization and you are interested in contributing to our knowledge about global language revitalization, uh, ELP is continuing and expanding that survey. So uh, we invite you to contribute your knowledge if you wish. It would be very much appreciated. There is a link in the slides. But if we wanted to get sort of a rough visualization of language revitalization worldwide, again, just from the information that's available, uh, the color density on this map represents roughly the density of revitalization initiatives in a given region as compared to the number of endangered languages in that region. So if you look at, say, North America, you'll see it's, it's pretty dark blue. That represents something like 26% of known endangered languages in North America have some type of revitalization effort underway, again, as far as we know. Uh, similarly, if you look at Mexico, Central America, and the Caribbean, it's about 20% of known endangered languages have some kind of revitalization work underway. But this doesn't hold in all parts of the world. There is a very unequal distribution of revitalization work so if you look at all of Africa, all of South Asia, most of Southeast Asia as well, you'll see it's roughly one and a half to two and a half percent of known endangered languages uh, are known to have some kind of revitalization initiative. So again, very uneven geographic distribution of revitalization work. Many reasons for that. That's, that's several whole other talks. Uh, but if we look at sort of the temporal angle, it's a very encouraging upward slope of revitalization efforts. So about two thirds of all known revitalization programs have begun since the year 2000. And almost a third of revitalization efforts have launched just since 2010. So again, a really steep growth. And hopefully we'll continue to see that kind of steep growth uh, with the upcoming UN Decade of Indigenous Languages starting next year. 
And in addition to existing revitalization programs, there is a lot of interest among users of indigenous or endangered languages in beginning new language revitalization programs. And so ELP often gets messages through social media or email, uh, very much like this one. This is a real email we got a couple weeks ago. Um, so this user from Iran said, unfortunately, we don't have systematic education and no authority doesn't help or support the language in question. There's no printed text in this language. We want to preserve this language. Please help us if you can. Our dream is this community studying and teaching in Iran schools and universities and our people write and read and talk this language in their life, right? So really clear goals for language revitalization, a, a clear sense of where they want this language to end up, but really not a good sense of how to begin. And so people will reach out to us saying, I want to achieve X for my language or even just sort of generally I have a sense that something is happening with the vitality of my language and I want to strengthen my language, I want to revitalize it, but I'm not sure where to start. We get a lot of messages like this. Uh, and so ELP is loosely speaking, uh, a collection of people with backgrounds in language revitalization and documentation around the world. So we are in theory in a good place to assist folks who contact us like this, or at least try our very best to assist. Um, I guess I should talk a bit about what ELP is and what we do in general. Uh, so currently, four of our main roles are, one, providing information about endangered languages. Uh, and so the Catalog of Endangered Languages is our academic component housed at UH Manoa. Uh, this is our database of information about the vitality of all of the world's endangered languages. Uh, we also host a lot of multimedia language resources, 7,000 some odd. Uh, videos, documents, audio files, uh, photos of community events. These are mostly user contributed. So this is a place for folks to share anything about their language that they would like to represent their language online. Uh, we're also sort of a, a newsroom for language related items. Uh, so we offer success stories, uh, funding notifications, uh, sort of news in language policy and activism. Um, featured uh, language content, uh, interesting information about why languages matter to different folks. Uh, I think this is, this is probably one of our most used roles. Um, and we also offer free training in language documentation through a series of webinars in collaboration with the Language Documentation Training Center based in Honolulu. Uh, so these are eight week webinars, free, open to anybody. Um, training in the, the most basic skills and concepts of language documentation with the aim to equip users of endangered languages to conduct language documentation to support whatever their language goals are. Uh, so a little bit of history, ELP launched in 2012. We're coming up on our 10 year anniversary uh, as a collaboration between four main partners, the First Peoples Cultural Council in British Columbia, the University of Hawaii at Manoa Department of Linguistics, the Linguist List, which at the time was housed at Eastern Michigan University, and google.org, the, the nonprofit side of Google. Uh, alas, we do not have access to the endless coffers of Google. We don't have all that Google money, unfortunately. Uh, and over the years, our governance council has grown and changed, and currently our lead partners are the First Peoples Cultural Council and the University of Hawaii at Manoa Department of Linguistics. Uh, and ELP is led by a governance council, currently 11 members uh, from five countries and a bunch of different institutions and universities. This is our wonderful governance council. And then uh, on the staff side, we have two main core staff folks uh, working to develop the revitalization help desk. Uh, so there's me, and there is also Amanda Holmes, our language revitalization associate. Uh, we both have PhDs in uh, language documentation and revitalization, broadly speaking, and uh, sort of different backgrounds geographically, personally, with regards to language revitalization. Uh, so those are, those are the two of us doing most of the, the core work. And so the goal, overarchingly, of a revitalization help desk like this is to connect folks who often feel like they're working in isolation, right? We get a lot of comments or, or contacts from folks saying, 
I'm doing work for my language, but really it sometimes feels like I'm the only person in Papua New Guinea who cares about local languages, or I'm the only person in my province who thinks that our language belongs in schools, or you know, really this, this sense of, of isolation in very challenging work is a big obstacle for a lot of folks, uh, especially in those parts of the world represented on the map with much lower density of revitalization efforts. And so part of our goal in developing this help desk project was to meet that need of folks to have connections, to have community and relationships with others who are doing this type of work all over the world. Uh, I actually just had an interview this morning with a language activist in Pakistan who said that seeing what other people are doing in other parts of the world, seeing success stories from North America, Australia, South America, this is what helps motivate him to keep going in a climate where not very many people share his concern for languages. Uh, and so in addition to providing folks with useful information, training, capacity building resources, our goal is also to foster what I might call in the non-academic sense, a community of practice, right? A, a community of folks engaged in this work who can provide support and encouragement and knowledge sharing and collaboration. In addition to sort of the existing density of language revitalization initiatives, there are really different resources available to support this work in different parts of the world. And obviously this is probably a big contributing factor to the differing densities of revitalization in different parts of the world that we saw. So obviously for folks like me in the US, Canada, Australia, Aotearoa, maybe a few other places like the EU, uh, there is access to formal or informal training and education in revitalization specifically, right? There are summer schools and extracurricular programs. We've got Colang and Breath of Life. Uh, and in a few cases, there are even sort of dedicated university programs for training in language revitalization. So revitalization focused departments like Hawaii, UVic, Arizona, lots of others. Uh, and then sometimes there's also access to training and support through nonprofits or NGOs. Uh, that would be SIL in a lot of parts of the world. And a pretty small number of countries really have governmental or, or even private funding available to support language revitalization. But as we are all painfully aware, even in parts of the world where those resources exist, they are not bountiful. There is not nearly enough funding to support this work. And that inequality is really evident when you look at different parts of the world. Uh, and so there's really a huge need for free training and infrastructure to support language revitalization practitioners, especially in parts of the world where there is no access to this kind of support infrastructure, right? Not everybody can, can fly to the US and go to Colang, unfortunately, because Colang is fantastic. Uh, and so some of the feedback we've received from language documentation webinar participants on why they joined the webinar in the first place uh, it's really along these lines. So someone from the Philippines said, I wish to have the skills to document and most especially to revitalize my mother tongue. Uh, someone from Greece said, I wanted to learn how I can save my language, what to do and how. I only wanted a tutor to guide me to this process. We'll come back to this idea of a tutor or a coach in a minute. Um, and the model we've been using, this webinar model, where folks from different parts of the world come together to learn and discuss and share their knowledge and experience, has been going really well for the last two and a half or so years, uh, especially since COVID, when online learning became sort of the default model. Uh, there's been really positive feedback to this webinar training model. Uh, so someone in Indonesia said, this seminar is infectious. This, this was pre-COVID feedback. I think they might have chosen a different word now. Um, but I'd like to highlight someone from Pakistan said, I'm really thankful to have shared precious knowledge, experience, and skills with thriving researchers. And this is the message we get over and over in response to these webinars is that one of the best parts is the opportunity to, again, connect with folks in different parts of the world, to build relationships with people who have maybe similar challenges or totally different challenges and to exchange ideas and support in this, again, community of language revitalization practitioners. 
And so the revitalization help desk was born from these experiences in offering sort of training and getting uh, contacted by folks who wish to begin a revitalization program of some kind, because this can be really daunting to start from zero on language revitalization work. Um, people have to figure out where to start, what methods might conceivably be appropriate, what resources those methods require, where to get those resources, and really just sort of the step-by-step, -step, what can I do, where can I start? And obviously there's a lot of fantastic information out there, but there are various barriers to accessing it. So obviously a lot of information is sort of behind paywalls, it's not available on the internet, uh, it might be written in dense academic jargon, right? If you're launching a language nest, it's useful to get some information from the child language acquisition literature, but it can be really dense and really difficult to process for non-specialists. Um, there's also the issue that there might not be a lot out there about language work in your specific language or cultural context, right? There, there might be some wonderful resources out there for starting language nests in the US, but not much on how this might work, say, in rural Indonesia. Uh, and so the, the goal of their help desk initially was to help folks get a foothold and figure out where to begin and where to go next. And so as we've begun developing out this help desk, uh, it's coalesced into four sort of pillar areas. Uh, so number one, obviously, connections and community. Relationships are a key part of successful language work. Uh, it will also provide free information and training in you know as accessible as we can make it no no jargon no paywalls just free hopefully fairly easy to to parse information uh, it will also really highlight stories of language revitalization work in different parts of the world and the various paths that are available for people to take in this work and then finally the help desk itself the help desk feature uh, will provide actual human beings for folks to talk with about their work, to exchange ideas, get support, get a little bit of extra guidance. And so obviously relationships are one of the most important parts of successful revitalization work. Uh, in this survey we discussed, a lot of respondents noted that relationships or, or human resources, the people involved were one of the biggest assets for the success of their program. Uh, and so to that end, we really want to facilitate a building of, of international community of practice in language revitalization. So we're going to include a, a fully opt-in directory, right? Nobody will be put in the directory against their wishes uh, of revitalization programs around the world to help folks connect with other people who are using similar methods, who might face similar obstacles. Uh, as well as a visual map of revitalization programs worldwide, right? We really want to highlight not only sort of the, the concerning, alarming, terrible aspects of language endangerment visually, but also to highlight the encouraging aspects of the growth of revitalization work in a visual way. Uh, it'll also feature stories of successful working relationships in language revitalization. So. Uh, ways that it has worked best to collaborate across disciplinary lines, across boundaries and borders, uh, ways that relationships have facilitated language revitalization work. And finally, one feature we're, we're sort of tossing around right now, and I would love your feedback during the question and answer, is a matching service to connect folks with specific skills that they want to contribute to revitalization programs like uh, web programming to folks who need those skills for their revitalization initiatives. Uh, this could be really handy. It could also be disastrous. And so we would love your feedback on whether you would use such a matching service. Uh, also, we're, we're continuing to provide information on language vitality via the Catalog of Endangered Languages, right? Having some idea of the current vitality of your language and the, the challenges it's facing uh, is a good starting point in strategic language planning. And we're also currently rebuilding this database of language vitality information in a form that's easier to search and easier to work with in partnership with Glottolog. We'll also be expanding it to include all of the world's languages, even those not currently considered endangered by our criteria, so that folks working in language maintenance on more stable languages can also have a space to gather and discuss. Uh, in addition, as I said, a lot of the information out there about language revitalization methodologies is kind of inaccessible. 
Uh, and so in addition to a bibliography of existing resources about language revitalization, the help desk will provide a lot of original videos and articles and how-to guides and planning templates in really plain accessible language in multiple languages. So plain English, plain Hindi, plain French, whatever. Uh, and in addition, we're going to expand our training program in language documentation to offer free webinars in methods in language revitalization uh, with, with input from revitalization practitioners all over the world. Uh, in addition, this where do I start question that keeps coming up, uh, we're developing a tool to help folks do sort of a self-assessment of their language's current needs and goals and available resources to help them get sort of an automated set of recommendations for where they might start. So sort of a little, a little quiz or flowchart tool uh, where folks can answer some basic questions and get a set of potential paths forward, right? So for example, it sounds like you have a number of fluent speakers who are elders uh, and you don't really want to engage the resources necessary to do a preschool or language nest. So may we recommend a mentor apprentice program uh, and then some resources on what mentor apprentice programs are, some stories of where they've been successful uh, and a few simple templates for planning out the path forward. Uh, and obviously stories are one of the ways that we share our experiences and, and find ways forward. And when we're doing work as challenging as language revitalization over the long term, hearing other people's stories can really help us keep going, right? As a lot of folks have said in interviews with us over the last few weeks, seeing success stories or even seeing stories of setbacks and challenges from other communities uh, provides a lot of inspiration and motivation to folks who are still finding their way towards a successful revitalization model. Uh, and so in addition to highlighting stories of individual communities or people's language revitalization work, uh, we're really going to focus on discussion and commenting tools for people to chat with each other, to exchange ideas and talk about their work. And finally, obviously, like we said, this work can be lonely and challenging and it takes a long time and a lot of effort. And a lot of the time we get contacts from folks who really want a person to talk to about their work, right? Some, some human interaction can go a long way when you are stuck or you're not sure what next steps to take. And so uh, sort of following the model of the First Peoples Cultural Council's language revitalization coaches, uh, the help desk itself will connect users with ELP revitalization mentors uh, through appointments for, for chat or video conferencing. Uh, and these will be sort of folks with a lot of knowledge and experience in language revitalization in different parts of the world, as well as different methods and tools who can help connect folks with resources that might be beneficial, who can talk them through next steps or sort of exchange ideas about how to overcome specific challenges in language revitalization, as well as, you know, just providing encouragement. This is hard work. And sometimes you just need a person to say, you're doing great, keep it up. Uh, obviously, there are major challenges to building a resource like this online. Uh, this is great for folks like you and me sitting in big cities with broadband, but in areas where that's not available, there's going to be limits to how useful this is. And so this new help desk feature is really going to focus on low bandwidth and mobile versions uh, for the vast majority of people in the world whose primary internet access is through mobile phones as well as creating a lot of resources in PDF or image format so that folks can circulate them via WhatsApp or WeChat or whatever sort of para-internet tools are most commonly used. And finally, it's gonna be important to work with local language champions on the ground to circulate information and tools through in-person outreach for folks who don't have consistent internet access. And of course, one major challenge is there is no one right way to do language revitalization. There is not even 10 right ways to do language revitalization. Uh, so when we're talking about flowcharts and recommended practices and how-to guides, this is all very general. This is really just to give folks ideas and provide stepping stones, right? There's no prescriptive correct model of language revitalization. And one of our goals is really to reflect the diversity of approaches and, and needs in language revitalization work. 
And so currently we are getting a lot of direct input from revitalization practitioners in different parts of the world. We've been conducting interviews with folks in a lot of different countries. And we would love to talk with you if you are either working in revitalization or interested in doing so, please get in touch. We'd love to talk with you about what you need and how we can support you. Uh, we're also gonna be holding a workshop at the end of this month, bringing together revitalization practitioners and scholars in this field from about 23 countries to share sort of the state of revitalization work in their communities and what needs there are that we can meet. Uh, and obviously we wanna be foregrounding the perspectives and goals of the relevant language communities throughout, right? So one of our goals is really to have stories of individual language revitalization projects at the foreground and always be presenting the perspectives of the folks who most need and want to use a resource like this. Uh, and finally, we're hoping to meet the need of, of the diversity of approaches by just constantly expanding, by having this thing evolve as a living resource as time goes on, right? So hopefully over the next decade of indigenous languages, we'll see new approaches and tools and concepts emerging to support language revitalization. And by having this as a constantly growing and evolving living resource, uh, we wanna reflect all of the exciting new stuff happening in revitalization going forward. So if you'd like to get involved, if you'd like to contribute feedback or ideas or let us know how we can support your work, please, please write anytime. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, and thank you so much for your kind attention. I'm, I'm looking forward to talking to you in the future at the Q&A. Everybody, please stay safe and healthy.